Welcome to the Outer Realm with Michelle DeRoche and Amelia Passano. Airing live on the United Public Radio Network, 105.3 FM in New Orleans. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Thursday night segment of the Outer Realm. We are broadcasting live on the United Public Radio Network, UFO, Paranormal Radio Network, 105.3 and 107.7 FM from New Orleans. We're fully sponsored by the amazing people over at Folgers Coffee, who have been a part of our, basically our little journey here for at least four years. So we're so appreciative. Thank you, Folgers. We just couldn't or wouldn't do it without you. Always so grateful and very humbled. Thank you. Also grateful and honored for his contribution of his time, his music, and his voice for the intro you just heard. Justice Snicker, a.k.a. Dr. Snick, the Sonic Surgeon, who's an award-winning composer of Halloween, horror, sci-fi, and dark wave electronic music, which can be found on all of your favorite music streaming platforms. So thank you, thank you. Also, big thank you, much, much, much gratitude to Steve McGinnis, the artist behind the banners and logos here at the show. Check him out on Facebook and Instagram, does great commission pieces, but he also specializes in the horror genre, horror movies specifically, and does amazing stuff. So tonight we are really pleased to welcome back the return of Michael LaFlemme talking about visions of Atlantis reclaiming our lost legacy. This is part two. So we are pretty much picking up where we left off and we just sort of had to stop midway and, and had to do another part two because it's just, there's just so much information and there's so much stuff coming up right now. That's sort of in different productions and, you know, a lot of, seeing it all over TikTok, new information surfacing, and I cannot wait to talk about it. So, hello, guys. Hi, Zizan. Hello, Catherine. Hi, Kazen. Hello. I hope I said that right. Hello, Kathy. Hello, Lady Spider Witch. I love it. Hello, hello. Great to see you guys here, as always. Uh, remember, guys, we do have seven chat rooms. Roku, TV does not have a chat room, um, but we do have seven. So it's sort of like the super highway coming down to like one lane. And um, we sort of have to keep up with the guests and then keep up with comments and such. I will flash things across the screen as we go along um, just so people see it, you know, our, our viewers. And we will address some of them, of course, which will be, you know, fantastic because you guys always have great things to say and awesome questions to ask. Um, and I just want to direct people over to um, who want to see some of the archives. Roku TV will be having some of our archives. So go back and check them out on the channel, which is United Public Radio. I suppose I should probably put a link to it. It's, it's, it's Paranormal and United Public, just saying. So I'm going to come in here. Just bear with me. I'm doing a faux pas, which is uh, kind of tinkering around a bit so i apologize so i'm going to come up here and put this up under the banner so i can show you guys um this is the link so the roku store i'm so let me just put this up so we're going to go roku channel bear with me okay which will be under UFO Paranormal and United Public Radio. So let me just put this up there. There we go. So just put that in there if you guys are Roku subscribers and you'll definitely be able to get in and um, find, you know, quite a few of the shows, but Roku glitches quite a bit. So we find we have to keep redoing this. So let's hopefully that's not going to be a thing, um, you know, forever because it's really getting to be, Oh, let's just say it's getting to be a bit of a pain. Sorry, Roku. <laughs> anyway, as we wait for um, Michael to join us, have, has anybody here seen the, the new 
series on Gaia called Mysteries of the Knights Templar. I'm giving them a bit of a plug. Um, fantastic. I have to say it, it definitely, I have, I have learned a thing or two and there are some things in there that, I mean, I'll say for the show, of course, but it's a bit mind blowing. I mean, when you think of the Knights Templar, you really are going back in time and you're thinking everything they were doing really revolved around their time period. But, you know, they were after relics, you know, they were on the Temple Mount, you know, they were grabbing things. But did you know that they were alchemists? Did you know that we knew they were Gnostics, right? But did alchemists and secrets of, wait for it, Atlantis, Atlantis, holding the, the secrets of Atlantis and how a lot of these relics and this information have to do with Atlantis, right? I'm, I was sort of like, holy crap, am I hearing this right? So it's, I think it's a, a, a season one has 10 episodes. Don't quote me. I, th I think that's it. I, I hope they come up with a season two because it's been pretty mind blowing to this point. And I have to say, I, I, I research a lot. And if I'm left gobsmacked going, uh, what did I, what did you just say? <laughs> You know, it's got to be good. And of course, I go in there and start cross-referencing things and start looking around. You know, I just don't take anybody's word for just anything. But it's it's very compelling stuff. Hey, Tamara, how's it going? Hello, hello. So we're, st we're just waiting on Michael to come in. And uh, hopefully he'll be here soon. So why don't I just fire off his his bio? So... Michael Laflem, M.A., is a best-selling author of 2022's Vision of Atlantis, Reclaiming Our Lost Ancient Legacy. He's an adjunct professor of history and philosophy, a columnist for New Dawn magazine, scuba diver and guitarist. I love it. He grew up in South Florida and attended the Harriet L. Wicks Honors College. And, uh, oh, I think we're doing that thing again. I'm, I'm pretty much thinking he might be uh we are live now uh no now oh boy oh boy i think he forgot that we are um uh now <laughs> uh eastern time i am live <laughs> oh i think this happened to us last time <laughs> <laughs> it's just totally like wrong time. So yeah, we, we do this. We do this. I think this happened the last time as well. Um, hold on. Let me just see. I'm trying to, I think we would have remembered from the last time that it was Eastern time. Uh, Eastern. Eastern right here. I'm just going to. Send this back off to him because I'm pretty sure he just forgot. Uh, paste from my email to you. Okay, there we go. There we go. There. All right. So anyway, um, <laughs> back to um, his, his bio. So he, he went to Harriet L. Wilkes Honors College and Florida State University, where he studied Western intellectual history and U.S. foreign policy. Uh, he's a book reviewer for Publishers Weekly and was a one-time research assistant for investigative journalist Whitney Webb when she was writing her best-selling two-part series, One Nation Under Black Milk. Good grief. Definitely, definitely knows his stuff. Um, okay, so let me just get to some of the comments. Um, I watch shows tonight about UFOs on Netflix, new documentary, Files of the Unexplained. I have friends on, on this documentary, so I'm dying to get into it myself. I cannot wait. I don't get Gaia, but familiar with the Templars into Alchemy in Atlanta, so very excited. It is very exciting, and I guess they feel that the time is now to come forward with all of this stuff. Hopefully this stuff will start being on platforms like Netflix or Amazon. Uh, but right now it's solely Gaia. Uh, so you would have to subscribe to it for sure. 
Uh, when the Knights Templar went to the ground, they turned into lots of things from mere soldiers. Oh, they sure did. Pirates, for one. And that whole unfolding of the United States. So exciting. Definitely great. Okay, so our guest is going to be coming in. <laughs> uh, hold on. Let me paste an email to you. Okay, coming in. Good. Okay, so we're just going to wait for him. So uh, here's just a little tidbit for you guys. Did you know... Let me pull this up. Here's a, here's a little fun fact from this TV series about Napoleon Bonaparte. Okay. Did you know that Napoleon, okay, was the, hold on, let me get to it. Uh, where are we? Ended up marrying. Okay. He was the illegitimate grandson of Bonnie Prince Charlie of Scotland as per Templar records. And ended up marrying, of course, Josephine, who was a Merovingian princess which traced back to the original French royal lines and allegedly the lines of those of Mary Magdalene, Jesus, John the Baptist, whole lot of stuff there as well, guys. That's that's a show in itself, <laughs> you know? Um, so that's pretty interesting. I did not know that about Napoleon. And I have to say, I was sort of like, what? <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, it's pretty wild. But technically speaking, you know, because you have... France, and then you all the way, Bonnie Prince Charlie out in, you know, up there in Scotland. So it goes to show you people kind of got around, but I thought that was really fascinating information um, to, to get a hold of. So they have a lot of records that go way back and hopefully we'll be able to delve into some of it um, this evening. So without further ado, our guests made it. <laughs> I'll just nod if you're ready. <laughs> Is he good? Ready to go? Okay, here we go. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. I think this happened the last time. I made sure in an email that went Eastern. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> yeah, we okay. are we all good. I mean, we could have held off a little bit to you know have a little bit of prep time for you, but I'm glad you made it. Of course. Thank and you. And uh, we are picking up where we left off. So what mm. I thought we would start is, um, first of all, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I thought we would just do a quick recap. I did feature the last segment with you on so people could watch it and catch up. But for those who didn't do that, like I instructed, mm. maybe you can <laughs> catch us up a little bit on your book why you wrote it, you know, what, what you wanted to put out there and then we will go. Sure. Um, I, I don't know why I wrote it. I couldn't tell you, <laughs> but okay. it, um, was a, a seven year, uh, project, seven year investigation. And, you know, I wrote it, uh, kind of reluctantly. I just had been kind of interested in this thing and it took on a, life of its own and i realized that um i had so many notes you know from myself that i was just kind of putting in a drawer and you know just for my own curiosity on this subject of of atlantis and at the end i realized you know maybe other people would be interested in uh reading it but i can't obviously just publish you know the collected notes right. of some lunatic so i have to write <laughs> a book um which i did and yeah it's it's to my great surprise you know became a, a amazon uh, bestseller and recently um you know selected by graham hancock as as a book of the month author that of the is month. amazing congratulations yeah which thank you so wow. you know which is crazy to me because uh as a you know teenager i remember reading his books and just you know not just the the material in them really right. interesting me but just the, the how great of a writer he is you know i always think people forget that a lot of people have written a lot of interesting books but it's very difficult to write a 600 page book on on anything oh, yeah. and <clears throat> keep people you know like a thriller turning the page right. turning the page so um right. I really tried to focus. I think that's why it took so long at the mm -hmm. end to, to to publish it because 
uh, I really wanted to make sure it was not just a dry, boring mm-hmm. catalog of you know, right. Plate, Plato said this and right. Plutarch said that. And it's like, who, who gives a damn, really? But tell a story that, you know, not, it, not only is just a, a fascinating, you know, window into what could have been, but informs the present in, in many ways. And in fact, I think it's maybe not a coincidence that there's been a kind of re- renewed interest in this particular topic because so many of the themes are kind of echoed in this uh, insanity, shall we say, that you know we find ourselves in today. Um, I at agree the end. with you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with you. At first, I was a really big deal with Graham Hancock, like Mr. Ancient History, right there. Mm. <laughs> you know, like he's <laughs> he, he's he's just brilliant. And to be recognized, like you say, you come in as this this young man and you're thinking, okay, I'm gonna put all this together and and to be recognized, I one of the greats in my opinion, mm. uh, that's a really big achievement. And I think the interest in Atlantis, I think you kind of got in before like the craze that's happening right now yeah. which is to your benefit now because now people are just like reclaiming our lost ancient legacy what yeah there's just <laughs> lots coming and we want to know what what is being said i mm. think there's a hunger for it because it's one of those things that have never been really solved it's never really been found and mm-hmm. then you come along and say that's because it was not just one place it was mm. different places, or it ended up being different places. Right. And now you've got a lot of things surfacing, like mm-hmm. which, which we can get into about the whole Knights Templar movement with Atlantis, how they were alchemists, and how they, like, everything. So, mm. you know, I don't know. But now this stuff's all over TikTok now, too. It's not just... <laughs> Mysteries of Knights Templar on on Gaia, where they're like, hey, by the way, we were just like hiding the secrets of Atlantis. Okay, what? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So. The, you know, and I don't know, maybe just because I'm still, there's like a little bit of uh, academic snob left in me, even though I don't teach at a <laughs> university anymore as a professor. But, you know, TikTok history, it's a kind of double-edged sword you know it's great Mm -hmm. in the sense that it at least introduces the subject to yes you know wide audience in a kind of easily processed way but i gotta be honest i've seen a lot of tiktok history that it's just like man what where did you get this where did you i know where are the sources this show is on gaia right now and and Mm. it's actually um i mean one of the main hosts on there is the grandmaster of the knights templar today uh right and he's he yeah secrets are being revealed and when they said okay no templars are alchemists they were you know they they were they studied the stars they they were gnostics they they had this Mm -hmm. whole ideology and they had the secrets so they found the secrets of Atlantis, and that goes back to I think you know the building of, of the Temple of Solomon, things like that. Like, there's sure. a lot to it that left me kind of going, okay, <laughs> <laughs> this is out there <laughs> because, yeah. like I was saying before the show, you think Knight like, Templar, you think ancient times, you think biblical times, you think there's the movement was back mm. then, but they came from all over. The whole, you know all over Europe and in the Middle East and throughout right. Egypt and and some of those secrets came right out of these areas, including Egypt. Would it stand to reason? I've been dying to pick your brain about this. I mean, I'm just like this show. <laughs> I need to know Michael's thoughts on this <laughs> this stuff. But if they went down there and they did, you know, look for traces and they did look for evidence of this, mm. these ancient cultures and um, I mean, every, everything, I mean, let's face it, the Baghdad battery, there's like this stuff down there that's mm. highly technological mm. is it possible. Yeah. I mean, I'm not an expert on uh, 
the Knights Templar, the way say, no, nor I. <laughs> I'm Freddy, repeating information. <laughs> yeah, the way say like Freddie Silva or other people who. Oh, he's know, been on the show. Yeah, wonderful. Right. Um, so I won't speak with any authority, but you know, certainly um, re regarding the, the the fact that they never really went away. I mean, I think. Mm you know, pretty compelling cases have been made that say the country of Switzerland, you know, just kind of curiously was founded a month or so after the Knights Templar were allegedly rounded up and, you know, all all killed. And the Swiss yeah. flag, of course, is the Maltese cross, the Templar cross, basically. Right. Um, and that Thanks the Templars you. were bankers. Yes. Switzerland, of course, is the head of the Bank of International Settlements. It's a mm neutral quote unquote country that seems to you know fund all world events but never be affected by them it's the source no of the that's true it's where you go to hide your money i know <laughs> yeah and it's but the they source were pirates of the... too you sure and, and the reason i mean I, the reason i ask is because you're saying what you're saying that the united states is possibly the new atlantis yes i i well you know and it's not just me that said that that's yes. what you know frederick yeah. oliver and his a dweller on two planets, the famous 19th century channeled text on Atlantis. He says that he said, and yes. Edgar Casey himself said the same thing. He said that a lot of the people alive in the 20th century or people that were born in the 20th century were originally in the third and final destruction of Atlantis. And I think it, it makes absolutely sense. I mean, it makes perfect sense. I mean, even on a kind of, um, you know, on a grander geographic kind of analog, it's like Atlantis, you know, obviously if you look at, for example, my book, I would show mm -hmm. you what I believe was the final size of the, you know, third and final iteration of Atlantis, the one Plato made famous, mm -hmm. which really would be called like the island of Poside, you know, yes. that's what most, most of the sources I use would have called it. Mm -hmm. from the culture of Atlantis, you know, just like there's the British Empire in England that includes right. its other colonies. But, you know, even though that was, you know, still roughly the size of, say, Spain or two thirds of the size of Spain, it was right. still a very powerful technologically advanced empire that was protected by the ocean. And it's right. like, well, that the United States in that sense, I mean, Mexico and Canada are not really threats to the united states they've been yeah. effectively neut neutralized a long time ago right. through economic and you know treaties well, but of course you know there's that kind of baseline analog a powerful mm -hmm. kind of island continent that's surrounded mm -hmm. by you know waters that can yeah that seeks to dominate the world with its culture but that itself faces these internal perversions corruptions evil mm -hmm. inner evil that's rotting away the core of the, the society, which, you know, is essentially the story that Plato described of the third destruction um, mm -hmm. of a culture. And, you know, famously, the, the kind of final line that nobody ever cites from the book, from, I think it's from the Timaeus or the Critias, but his, his two dialogues where he talks about Atlantis, where he says, you know, to the untrained eye, it looked like they had achieved, you know, the most magnificent, incredible, rich culture. But to those who had you know, an eye to see, you could see that they were being overtaken by their greed and avarice and, you know, basically about to self-destruct. So it's mm -hmm. not, I think, you know, a lot of things, I always tell people, it's like, number one, you can't pretend that just because something's old, even to go back to ancient Greece, if I put you in Athens right, in 360 BC, you wouldn't feel like you're in an ancient world. In fact, it would actually probably feel exactly as real as it is today. Uh, and I think it's such a silly kind of obvious thing to tell people, but because right. of the nature of technology, it's like, what do we have to represent that time? Frescoes, paintings. What do we right. have to represent the Wild West? Black and white photos, you know? But it's like when you see a full hd remastered color video of world war ii it doesn't look old it looks That's exactly right. the way life looks right. today so i always right. tell people like and it's the same with personalities like you wouldn't think plato was an alien species he would have the same pretty much personality as you maybe just have certain 
beliefs that are foreign to you, you know? Right. Um, but right. I would go further and say that if you go back 12,000 years, say to the final destruction of Atlantis, it would almost appear, I would argue, indistinguishable from say living in a Dubai today or something right. like that. If you follow the, you know, um, channelings or say psychic evidence of yes. Edgar Casey describing like a city um, before the final destruction or something like that. So I think, you know, we have this idea of like, oh, it was just, you know, kind of a fantasy land or something like this, but that's not at all what the, um, you know, evidence suggests. It would suggest that these people were in possession at some points, not at all points, mm -hmm. just like we were not always in possession of advanced technology and we right. might lose it and then we might rediscover it in thousands of years if we survive. Right. But I think what I was trying to show in the book is, you know, paint a real picture of like, what mm -hmm. would it have been like, say, to live in the capital city on the island of Poside at 11,000 BC? What would it have looked like? Right. This is right. exactly what it would look like. This is what the houses look like. This is what the gardens look like. This is what the metro rail system looked like. This is what the power source looked like. And the only way to get access to that mm. is through clairvoyance, which understandably many people say, I don't believe in that. And that's fine. I'm not asking you. But I would ask you to explain how these same clairvoyants that provided this evidence also mm. found missing persons in real life, healed people in real life, were yes. studied by medical doctors from Harvard, Stanford, Princeton yes. in real life, trying to debunk them unsuccessfully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then revisit what they said about other historical things mm -hmm. that they could not have known about that later proved true. So right. I don't just, you know, go yes. into Reddit forums and say, Miss Cleo said there was a monorail transit system in Atlantis. I'm going to put that right. <laughs> right. You know, I'm looking yeah. at two things. I'm looking at people who were the first to ever yes. channel this subject. And right. I believe... I've identified those so that they could not have been I agree with you. Yeah. by reading other people. And then just the motive, like what was the motive? Well, in Frederick Oliver's case, it was never even published before he died. So it wasn't right. a monetary motive. Right. He himself said, I don't know where this came from. Right. I don't, I don't, he said himself, I've never believed in channeling. I'm mm -hmm. not religious. I'm just a kid living in a mining town in 1862 when this right. evidence 1882 excuse me when this right. started to come through me mm -hmm. and i got it out right. same with edgar casey edgar casey never made any money off of his channelings he did it because he thought he was a christian and he liked to help people so he's been validated on many things so there'd be no reason right for this to be any different than any of his other channelings with respect to authenticity no and i go to quite extensive pains in the book to show you like here is every single counter argument he's right. a fraud he's make he's a charlatan he's pretending he none of those make sense in fact the actual most uh, like realistic thing if we're being honest is that he did possess an extraordinarily rare talent and it was yeah. true right. <laughs> and right. we just he's don't like it. to admit that because that kind of invalidates western materialist science which says that we are not in possession ourselves, or at least right. potentially of this connection to what Casey would call the Akashic field, which right. itself betrays a kind of technological awareness because we are talking right now across yes. ethernet. Yes. Well, in Sanskrit, Akasha means sky or ether or space. So when Edgar Casey, who didn't study Sanskrit in a trance, said i'm using the akashic records he's basically describing in 1932 before <laughs> wireless right. internet that there is a cosmic wireless energy field that records all events in history dolores right. cannon has claimed that's what she's tapping into in her hypnosis sessions and yes. that that's the only way to actually go beyond let's say the extant historical mm -hmm. sources and that's why i called the book you know, double entendre visions of Atlantis because yes. it's number one, literally psychic visions of this period, but also 
visions in the sense of how has the story evolved through mm-hmm. the lens of different cultures, you know, because I think I wanted to show people that, yes, this is a book, I guess, on Atlantis, but it's really a critique of how the whole historical field progresses. And it's not, I, I don't think people are taught this in school, you yeah. know, which is essentially, <laughs> yes, at best, a kind of escape from your parents, and maybe you learn a thing or two, at worst, a controlled brainwashing apparatus for the next, you know, slave <laughs> class that's graduating for the empire. But you're not really taught historiography until graduate school, which is the sense of let's take one subject, World right. War One. How was that talked about after the war? How was mm-hmm. it talked about in World War Two? How was it talked about after World War Two? How was it talked about after this? And you see that even contemporary subjects are treated mm-hmm totally differently Mm -hmm. depending on the people writing about them the culture and the context Mm -hmm. you know and i know this from experience because my first book my master's degree was looking at how the enlightenment which we all think is a good thing and you know freeing people from superstition and modern science and medicine in the times of the american and french revolutions we would think that's a good thing but if you look at actually how people talked about the enlightenment after world war ii they Mm -hmm. actually attributed say the holocaust to enlightenment ideals and said this could not have happened without this dehumanizing rationality that led to looking at human beings as statistics because believe it or not like people pre-enlightenment didn't even have a concept of sociology or demographics or dividing the world by subhuman and human these were ideas that actually evolved out of what we would consider a good thing Mm -hmm. and so when you look at atlantis it's like pretty much the same thing how do you from the first detailed accounts you know plato's accounts proclus all these ancient historical sources from greece and rome and associated areas and then get to like you know, today where it's like, oh, if you believe in that, you're crazy and you meditate with (laughs) crystals and, you know, you go to yoga retreats, probably. It's like, well, the founder of philosophy, (laughs) the student of Socrates was the one that told us this story. Right. And I'm pretty sure nobody would say Plato's a silly or frivolous source. Um, No, not yet. (laughs) Yet. Not yet. I think that that just that part, everything else is true. You know, Mm -hmm. like the story of Socrates, we don't, nobody questions, was Socrates a real person? Well, he didn't write anything. Pretty much everything we know is from Plato and a handful of poets, but nobody would say, oh, you believe in Socrates? (laughs) Right, right, right. Oh, of course it's from Plato, Plato never lied. But somehow he's lying about this because we haven't found it and it's, 9,600 years before his time, you know, and, and, and that's too far for our minds to stretch. And what I wanted to show is just that, no, it's actually not too far for your minds to stretch. And strangely, if he was making that date up, which he places at 9,000 years before the time of Solon, which puts mm-hmm. it around 9,600 BC, roughly, plus or minus 40 years, well, let's just say 9,600. If he's making right. that up for the end of a global civilization at the, you know, cause unknown, but likely a comet, as he describes in his book, um, mm-hmm. which hit the earth and caused a flood or caused it rather more precisely to sink into the ocean. Mm-hmm. Let's be clear about that, too. That's an interesting guess, because that's what modern geologists and climatologists would tell you is the beginning of the Holocene era and the end of the ice age by flooding. That's also the exact time range that the, you know, Yuga cycle from the Mahabharata written before Plato said Mm -hmm. was when the world was destroyed through cataclysmos, which was the flood. So it's like, Mm -hmm. "Mm, he got the end of the ice age, right? Somehow he, he, he knew that, but everything else was fake. You know, because we haven't found 
a circular city at the bottom of the Atlantic that says, welcome to Atlantis. You know, the big flashing the neon sign. Here, right. you made it, you know. Yes. Uh, Tamara says, was Plato not told by the Egyptian priests about Atlantis? Well, Solon, his distant relative, about 300 year, 240 years before Plato wrote his dialogues, mm -hmm. his right. distant relative, Solon, who was a Athenian law reformer, he went to the temple priests at Sais in lower, I believe is in lower Egypt, and he asked them for the whole history of the Greek people, the Hellenic race. And they said, look, you guys think you're so smart, you know, even though you basically ripped everything from us, you know, Pythagoras, and all of your great knowledge came from Egypt. We are the true progenitors of, you know, mm. history. So that's why you're here as the leading Athenian lawgiver asking us what the hell happened in ancient past because we write things on stone and you Greeks keep things in papyrus and you put them in temples so that when bad things happen, when celestial objects fall from the sky, this is what they said, right. it burns right. up everything upon the earth and you're left to begin again like children. Whereas we right. record things in stone, we make pyramids, we make monuments, tablets in stone. And from these stories come the story of Atlantis. That's where the story, you know, mm -hmm. really starts. Um, from that point. But I would add that in the book, as I show, there are at least seven pre-Platonic sources that talk about Atlantis. So we can drop that right now that he invented it out of whole cloth, as one critic said. Uh, that story is actually the most detailed but the word Atlantis and a story about a destruction of a mid-Atlantic civilization was actually right. in the Mahabharata, which <laughs> describes it as the island of Atala. Right, right. So, I just wanted to put the book cover up, people, just so you can see it. So keep keep going, please. Well, I'll periodically put it up for people. Right. So, you know, what Plato was doing, I think, was... You know, he was just translating or rather transmitting and repopularizing a story that had almost certainly, from my research, been in Greek culture for at least 100, 200 years before Plato. Um, because, again, I always tell people some things are hidden in plain sight. Yes. And you really have to pay attention when you're citing ancient sources because a lot of things that people focus on, they're missing. Like I always tell people... The context of this dialogue <laughs> where they're talking, you know, I think it's Critias talking to Socrates and Socrates is telling the story to Critias, you know, mm -hmm. in this dialogue. And it's like every dialogue is like a play. So what's the setting? Well, the setting is the Panathenaea, which is a cellar ceremony, the greater and lesser Panathenaea, where it's this big ceremony mm -hmm. in, uh, in honor of the goddess Athena. And Socrates says, you know, in honor of her great victory all those years ago against mm -hmm. the marauding Atlanteans who were coming into the Mediterranean, we must recall her story and how right. it went down. Right. You know, and I've had many people say as a kind of surface level critique, well, it's a fake story or it's a story talking about 900, 600 BC and Plato just added a zero because there were right. no Greeks at 9,600 BC. That's the story. That there was no Greek culture, so how could he be saying that Athena beat the Atlantean? Right. But I would argue that there's a part in that dialogue where he's talking about the Acropolis, and he's like, you know, this has been here a lot longer than you think. And Not when then, we were, I know. Yeah. And we were known <laughs> as the Hellenes, or Hellenists, yes. not, not the Athenians, when we yes. were just a kind of like proto-Doric culture, it was different. You know, right. so it's like, first of all, how do we know how old the Acropolis settlement is? Have we excavated every inch of the Acropolis and down half a mile to 10,000 BC right. strata? No, we right. don't, right. you know? And, you know, I would just caution people really like when they immediately balk at that, at that date, you know, of 9,600, mm -hmm. because it is a kind of universally understood date today for when mm -hmm. something happened that was right. cataclysmic, 
comet, solar event, whatever, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. melted all the glaciers in North America, flooded the entire earth and raised sea levels, you know, mm -hmm. potentially, you know, well, 60, 100 meters. a lot meter. of places out. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, so well, to me, it's it's actually, you know, if he had put that date at another arbitrary number, mm -hmm. then we could say, okay, well, is there evidence that anything happened? But I find it quite strange that the Mahabharata, you know, or excuse me, it was the, um, yeah, no, it was the Mahabharata, mm -hmm. you know, written at least 1000 BC, mm -hmm. could be much older, but I right. take a conservative date with everything just to be thousand bc says right. there was this place called atala that sank into the western ocean right you know in mm. that same story uh you're talking about the yuga cycles which is you know basically describing the procession of the equinoxes the earth going through all the constellations every roughly twenty five thousand, i think 600 years Mm -hmm. And in the corrected version of that, which my colleague Babu Dev Mishra outlined in his excellent book, Yuga Cycle, mm -hmm. he determined that the real, you know, ending of that cataclysmos period was about 9,600 BC, which again is the same <laughs> window Plato yes. was talking about. Yes. And the end of the Kali Yuga or the mm -hmm. Iron Age of deception, greed, perversion, and evil mm -hmm. is 2025. Well, then. So look around. <laughs> <laughs> look well around. Then. That we yeah. are literally at the 11, 000, roughly 12,500 year exact counterpoint to the fall of Atlantis on the circle of the Yuga cycle. That if this was the fall of Atlantis here at 9,600, you go half moon, bing, 2025. I, I have to wonder if this is why so much interest, like there's so much information coming out. It's like this it's renewed be. interest. I wonder if this this cycle. It's got to be because I can't explain why I felt compelled and obsessed to write a book right. about this. I, I'm right. a historian of World War II. That's what, that's right. what I do. You know, right. I'm a military historian who likes World War II battles and things like this. Right. Um, right. I had to re-educate myself um, in the classics for like two years, you know, and really spend a lot of time like putting myself through a graduate level school of ancient history, ancient philosophy, and mm -hmm. then it took them another two to three years of reading books on clairvoyance to understand the validity of it, of remote right. viewing and how the government used it. And what are the right. scientific explanations for the process? Like, yes. how yes. does hip, how do hypnagogic trances work? What is the evidence that they work? What are the things to avoid when you're looking at mm -hmm. channeled evidence? And so I almost had to, like I said, I did it to from myself. Um, yes. And then at the end, was like, well, why did you do all that? You know, are you going to be like that kid, Frederick Oliver, and just leave it in a box and somebody publishes it when they die and they're looking through your stuff? <laughs> right. Or maybe right. put it out there. And as you said, I was quite shocked when I released it because I saw like five different books on the same damn subject. Right. From people I had never talked to, to the point where each of us were like, like a you collective know, consciousness thing. <laughs> it must have been because I remember talking to another author and we published our books within two months of each other. And he was just a 21 year old kid in Poland. I, and I called him Alexander, one day. Yes. Alexander Cheskovitz. And I called He's him and I'm like, show? yes. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Who the, well, how the hell did you like, I'm not accusing you of plagiarism, but God damn, like this is exactly the book he's Two like I could different say the parts same of the thing. world you guys are at he said i could say the same thing like you came to the same exact conclusion in this one chapter of your book and i was like look this is this is unbelievable and you know we got to really think about this and then we just saw other people that we've never talked to that i don't even think read our books right come to the same conclusions and it's like okay maybe this is some like 
Jungian archetypical trauma that is now because we are at that, you know, half point coming right. out into the kind of collective. Uh, it has to be. You guys are in two different parts of the world. You know, when Alexander messaged me, he goes, oh, you got to check out my friend Michael. And I was literally <laughs> like, what? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, he's a funny kid. He he's is. just he's yeah. just let me turn off my alarm here give me yeah, one yeah one moment nope yeah i know it, it's fantastic because just brilliant mind you know but i i love that that you guys you know you, you really dig deep <laughs> i i think the mystery and the allure of Atlantis is just because of the fact that there's just been so much that involves it. It's never been found. It's like Shangri-La. It's like, you know, <laughs> the, the, the city of gold in South America, which they think they El found, Dorado. you know? Well, right? yeah, apparently didn't, didn't, didn't have Percy Fawcett. Didn't he find it, but then everybody he, died or something. Yeah. Something crazy. It's just like, you <laughs> one know, guy got back. I think it was like one guy got back out of the jungle and said like oh no we found it and then i don't know what happened to him but you know the thing is i always tell people and this is where alex really like shuts down this argument in a way that i kind of do it but he he has like a whole sub chapter on exactly that question and it's yes. like a chart of the decay of material objects yes so it's like how long does steel last how long does yes. glass last? How long does stone that's not in a megalithic architectural configuration last? Like a brick temple. Yes. And what you discover is that, let's pretend it's true, that there was a global civilization centered around a powerful mid-Atlantic island called Atlantis that was destroyed 12,000 years ago. Let's just take Plato at face value. What would be left? Oh, I don't know exactly what is left today, which are related, uh, but in culture, quote unquote, culturally different context, megalithic structures that all seem to align to a specific time based on archaeoastrology, which is generally 10,500 BC, you right. know, for their right. construction. And right. that also happens to be the date that Edgar Casey, before Robert Bolval discovered that archaeo-astrological ob observation of Giza lining up to Orion at 10,450 BC, Edgar Cayce was asked, when were the pyramids built? In 1932. And to my knowledge, nobody had ever proposed this date before he said this. And he said, they started in 10,490 and ended mm -hmm. in 10,390. It mm -hmm. took 100 years and it was used it was built using magnetism. He says the same forces that make iron swim in the present on a compass were used. He says in that same matter, stone <laughs> floats in the same matter. Right. And yet here we are running these absurd calculations, which again, Alex's book, I almost fall out of my fell out of my chair when I read this part, where he he <laughs> runs the numbers on okay, the the Great Pyramid has roughly two point three million blocks i don't think most people realize that i know it's pretty it's pretty intense <laughs> to so get your head around each of those blocks weighs roughly the the weight of a let's say ford explorer suv oh i've been to the size of one <laughs> right as well so you're yeah. talking about you're moving two and a roughly 2.3 million suvs yeah. stacking them in a more precise alignment than the Greenwich Tower we used to measure. Not on wheels, people, just saying. <laughs> Which makes it harder. They don't roll. And Alex said, let's just pretend that that was done through manpower, slave power, a ramp, whatever. Yeah. There's no evidence Adding that any of these wheels. things were ever done. <laughs> yes. But let's just pretend that. That's a story that Herodotus, writing thousands of years after their even official date, Right. Claimed was the case, but Herodotus is not a primary source because he's writing, even if we accept the official, which is not official because it's never written anywhere in Egyptian records that Khufu built it at this time. That's just what Egyptologists have decided. Yes. Be very clear on that. Yes. There is no document 
<laughs> unless right. it's in the Vatican or something like this, that ever says this was built at this time. Let's just be very clear. And this is a supposition that has been agreed upon by people who don't like to admit they could be wrong. Right. But anyway, let's just pretend that's true. Well, Herodotus is not a primary source. Herodotus right. is writing 2,400 years after the purported date of the construction of the Great right. Pyramid. But he's the one that comes up with ramps and this and that. Now, medieval Egyptians did not describe it being written. Medieval Arabic sources actually are closer to the sources Casey says, where it's like priests, you know, blew a special tool with a strange sound and the stone lifted off the sand. And yes, <laughs> frequency. And we say, oh, well, yeah, they also said Aladdin had a flying carpet and that's right. cute. And, you know, abracadabra. Craft. <laughs> But you're talking, if I showed Thomas Jefferson Alexa, he would think I'm a magician. Right. And that's only 200 years ago. If I showed Ben Franklin uh, a car automatically starting with a key fob, okay, that's a magician. You right. know? So right. I don't think it's magic. I just think it's, and magic itself is just something we don't understand. It's a physical paradigm we have yet wrapped our minds around probably if it mm -hmm. is real but i would agree that they had a technology from atlantis being yes. emigres before the final destruction as casey oliver numerous other channel sources who never talked to each other all mm -hmm. say the same thing that around 10,500 bc these people were aware we got to reboot because it's about to fall. There's going to be a cataclysm. They studied astrology, astronomy. They knew the cycle was ending. We're going to Egypt. We're going to Yucatan. We're going to basically the Basque country where, again, an unknown non-Indo-European language that's mm -hmm. more closely related to Yucatan languages in Mexico mm -hmm. emerges. And it's like, mm -hmm. okay, if Edgar Casey said they went to China and Malawi and the Maldives, right. you'd say, okay, that's weird because there's literally no connection regarding this subject of those three places. Mm -hmm. But he did. He said they went to the Yucatan Peninsula, they went to the Pyrenees Mountains, and they went to Giza. And it's like mm -hmm. the Basque language actually is closer to the Yucatec language than to any of the surrounding languages in Europe. Mm -hmm. The Basque people have a legend of coming from yes. Atlantis. Yes, yes, they do. The Mayans, you know, and the Aztecs. The word Aztec comes from Azteca, which means the people from Aztlan. Yes, yes. What's that all about? <laughs> What's the Mayan, you know, Popol Vuh story? You know, there's so many things that should not exist if mm. indeed there was nothing in the mid-Atlantic except empty ocean and these cultures were not connected until Columbus. That wouldn't right. explain how there's an Aztec pre-conquistador god called mm -hmm. Atlanteotl, who I have a picture of in the book, holding the heavens on his shoulders that's identical to the Greek titan Atlas, <laughs> and they're yes. separated by the Atlantic <laughs> Ocean. It's like, well, actually, it makes a lot more sense that Atlantis was real. It's just, you're not going to, and I, again, I'm not trying to, right. you know, hate on these TikTokers and people like this, but it's like, when you say find it, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. What do you mean? What do you mean find it? Like right. we found the Great Pyramid. It's It's been there for a long time. Right, right. You know, right. Did it, find it. Well, I think you have people taking bits and pieces of different productions that they're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, some of these are YouTubers and they're, they're a lot of, I noticed a lot of people commenting on the series I was telling you about that is only on Gaia. So not everybody subscribes to Gaia. I happen to because I'm a researcher. I do a lot of shows. I've been in the mm -hmm. media field for the last two decades and the research field of high strangeness. So I, it's my mm -hmm. job to put things, be on different platforms, piece things together and, and, and and talk about it that's that's what it's about the fact that this has resurfaced at this time 
you know, the, the getting close to the 2025 thing now makes a little bit of sense to me as to, you know, why it's being released. And they're saying, well, you know what? They tried back in the 1800s to release this, but people just didn't seem to have interest or they were, they feared it or they were just too conditioned, whatever the case may be. Now they're trying it again. And it seems to be more like more well received. People mm. seem to be a little bit more open minded about it. And I'm wondering it is this a, as a collective consciousness thing, or is it that there is a renewed interest because people want to know the truth. We're in an age where people want to know the truth. I think they don't want to be conditioned anymore. They don't want to just follow the mainstream. And I think this is why books and research such as yourself and Alexander and many others, Graham Hancock. I think this is why people are saying, no, give us something tangible. Give us something that we can actually sink our teeth into and make it something believable. Mm. Yeah, and I th and I think that's what the research does, but that's a lot of years of research. Yeah, it's 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 a lot of research, and it's a lot of you know ridicule from not just the like I, I really couldn't care less what you know, um, you know academia thinks. I mean, academia is is it's at this same. point so kind yeah. of. I mean, I would be really surprised just from. Uh, financial standpoint if young people are even going to college in 20 years I, I, and and with the availability of you know information on the internet and you know access mm -hmm. to information i don't even i, I don't even think that model is going to endure right. but so i've never really cared what academics think but it's just quite amazing like how the average person you know who knows nothing really at all about this has been conditioned and it is conditioning let's be very clear on that it's not mm -hmm. it is it's not a natural thing to believe in dinosaurs right. but to think atlantis is fake we're talking so you, i used to tell people that so you believe that giant lizards roamed the earth 75 million years ago right but it's impossible that there could have been a new york city in the atlantic ocean with a circular moat around it 12,000 years ago. Right. So you've you've never seen a dinosaur. You don't even have an analog for that. But you right. believe that. Right. Right. Well, I think people now are starting to believe but, that Atlantis may have been more than just one island. That that they have the technology to branch out. And that some that they did branch out, whether it was upon destruction or whether it was beforehand. Um, that they would have limited themselves to just one place, not being that technologically advanced, but they would have been able to move forward. Maybe this is why we haven't found it. Maybe it's because we're looking for one place. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's more than one place. Well, it is a global culture. And again, Plato only has the most, let's say, recent iteration of what would be a three-tiered multi-millennial similar but very different in different iterations culture and so plato is not the end all story actually it would be like if you were studying the history of western civilization let's say in thousands of years from now mm. and you only had the united states and all the things going on in the world since 1776 and you mm -hmm. literally had no access to the renaissance the middle ages the dark ages the fall of rome ancient greece the hellenic right. era you know like you're missing a lot but you right. can kind of see okay yeah that would make sense if we had access to that it's the same with atlantis plato is telling the story of the third and final destruction of which Edgar Cayce and others elaborate through their psychic visions. There were two other ones, the first being 50,000 BC and 722, 50,722, right. when Atlantis was a larger continent that kind of included where Cuba is now all the way through the Mid-Atlantic Ridge up to the Azores presently, right. which right. then broke up into five large islands then there was a second destruction he claims was 28,000 BC, two sank, three remained, of which one was called Poseid, the other two were called Og and Arion. 
And I would argue because Plato describes the temple of Poseidon in the capital city mm. of Atlantis, that right. he's describing the island of Poseidon within the Atlantean archipelago, because he does mention an archipelago, which people forget in that dialogue. He says right. it had dominion over the other islands as well. Right, right. And from those islands, you could reach the whole of the continent across the true ocean, which again, how did he know about North America in 360 BC if it was Columbus that discovered it? Well, Nobody, we know that's, that's a... Even if you think this story is fake, let's just say this is a fable, it's a metaphor. Yeah. How did he know the Ice Age ended in 9600 BC? Which he did. And how did he know North America existed? When he was writing from Athens in 360 BC, and he was getting this information from the Egyptians. How did the Egyptians, the original source, know about North America, know a comet hit the Earth at 9600 BC? (laughs) How do they know all this if they're all just wackadoo, you know, there's no way you, this you, all up. you're not that technologically advanced and limit yourself to one very small space. I mean, we don't do it. You know, we we branch out. I think I think human nature, it's our nature to want to explore. It's our nature. We, we want we want, you know, answers. We want knowledge. We want to see what's beyond you know, our box. We want to see what's in the great expanse. It's just, we have explorers and we, by we're natural explorers. How many cultures are nomads? They just roam. It's just, it's the way it is. You don't have that kind of technology and say, no, we're not going to do it. And in, 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 I'll give you two examples. People besides that. Right. I'll give you two examples from, mainstream history that really well one example from mainstream history one from a channeled account you tell me okay but we know that egyptian mummies from dynastic egypt so let's say roughly 2500 bc onward to the right. Ptola, to the ptolemaic era of say cleopatra and her great 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 grandfather ptolemy who inherited egypt and made it hellenized after alexander the great's conquest of that right. part of the world that's right. Um, although, according to Netflix, you know, Cleopatra was a very beautiful, light skinned black woman. But <laughs> in yeah. in the. Not, not a story, track. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And I, and I was her brother, you know. <laughs> I was her brother of French and Bahamian, uh, Ptolemaic Greek. I was, I was her brother, Ptolemy. You know, I was, I was almost cast for that role, but they, they nice. didn't take me. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, we know that Egyptian mummies from, say, roughly like 3,000 years ago, have right. in their DNA samples traces of cocaine and marijuana. And cocaine is not indigenous to Egypt. It's indigenous to the Americas. That's right. So in South America. How the hell did the pharaohs get their coke? I mean, even if they had a really good coke dealer, he I had to come across the Atlantic Ocean. That's true. Or they had to have already had pre-existing trade and knowledge of the Americas as late as 2000 BC, which again, rewrites the whole story that this was, you know, a a very isolated world separated by vast oceans and only, you know, Christopher Columbus, you know, when he got to the West Indies was the first to brave it. Similarly, the, you know, Carthaginians, who are descendants of the Phoenicians, who were yes. some of the greatest seafarers in ancient world, you know, they claim to have gone to places like Brazil, but all of the records were utterly destroyed by the Romans during, I believe, the Second Punic War. They burned the library. So it's like, mm-hmm. we don't have any records of that. We just mm-hmm. have weird Phoenician artifacts that people sometimes find in rivers in Brazil, you know? And I, had, I had friends in Costa Rica who found some very interesting things. So it's all down there, without a doubt. Right. And, you know, to go even further, like, you look in, th- this was a real kind of interesting part of the investigation in, in the book, was in the 1800s in the United States, in Upper Peninsula, Michigan, near Lake Superior, there are these islands 
where explorers found in the 1800s 3,000 mines of copper. And they didn't thousands really under... Thousands of years old. Thousands of years old with strange Phoenician or Minoan-like markings on them. Now, they didn't know what these were. They said, well, it's probably Native American. But the, the problem is today, through, you know, extrapolation, we've determined that more copper was extracted from those mines than ever existed on Earth in any museum from the Bronze Age when, you know, historians think this mm -hmm. was mined by Phoenicians potentially. But then I take it a step further, and I've never heard anybody propose this, which is in Frederick Oliver's 1882 book, A Dweller on Two Planets, right. which is a, he didn't go into a trance. He wrote it. He claims he dictated a voice in his head that told him to write his story down from 11,160 BC on the island of Poside. That's the story that becomes a dweller on two planets. In that story, the voice that's telling Oliver, the kid, to write this says, I used to live in Poside and I was a prince at one point. I was promoted to the role of prince, which was called Astica. And he says, when I was in Astica, I used my veil, which was a cigar-shaped aluminum transmedial air and submersible vehicle with a picture. Right. He draws a picture in the book that I put in my book of this machine. And again, he drew this before the Wright brothers. So mm. he There's... says, we flew around the world in this cigar shaped transmedial object called a veil. And now that's interesting, V-A-I-L-X or Velx. Right. That's right. a Sanskrit word that also is describing flying machines from Indian epics. And it's like, I don't think a kid who was 17 years old, uneducated, was reading and fluent in Sanskrit no. in, in, in Washington in 1882. I, I don't right. think that was the case. So that's right. weird that he called it that. Right. And then also, he says, at one point, we're taking a tour because I'm an administrator for the government of Rai Gualan, who is the emperor of Atlantis in 11,160 BC. And he says, he told us to go check on our copper mines in the Upper Peninsula Lake Superior region of what you call today Michigan. Right. And so when Gavin Menzies says, look, even if these were Phoenicians, where did all this copper go? Well, I would argue it was taken back much earlier, like 11,000 BC, right. and used to build the walls of parts of Atlantis. Because in a, Plato's story, he describes the different metals they used to line the walls, one of which was auric calcum, which many people have argued is this magical alloy but really the root of orichalcum orichalcos is mountain copper so it's like right. even if it was an alloy copper was included in orichalcum and if we can't figure out where the hell all this copper went from this weird mining like industrial mining complex that's at least three thousand years old maybe that's where atlantis was getting a lot of their copper because i i wouldn't doubt that just like you know we don't have it's, lithium and it's mines. all underwater now right right, right. It, exactly right. exactly so you would probably be best looking for that in the azores or something like that if you're indeed but again look at alexander cheskovitz's chart how long does copper last does copper last right. twelve thousand years underwater right. probably not i would argue or it's not even identifiable. It's it would just be green, green yeah, and pitted, I would think. You know, it would not be what we think it is. It I think there's a lot of, of grief growing up. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of stuff, you know, in the new world. Like we look at at Michi like Michigan, for instance, mm -hmm. that we, we spoke about. You know, let me just pop this up for a second. So if we're looking, you know, this, this right here, sorry, but I'm, I just scrapped sure. that. <laughs> but this right here. And you know, which is a representation, it looks a lot like Stonehenge, right? You know, and and this is a rock that's right, right in this complex in Lake Michigan 
This is a mastodon. I mean, right. this is all stuff that's underwater in Lake Michigan right now. You look at a lot of this technology that mirrors Stonehenge and other technology in, you know, in the other, you know, over the pond mm -hmm. in England and all different parts of the world. They would have had to come over. Somebody would have had to come over. This is pre Ice Age. Right. Right. So, yeah, and again, you know, even that word is, um, you know, it's so kind of like United States centric because, yes, indeed, 13,000 years ago, half of North America was covered in a mile plus sheet of icy yeah. tundra. Yes. But it wasn't the Ice Age in Siberia, it was actually a temperate, almost semi tropical environment. Yes. Same with possibly Antarctica at that time. Right. And places like right. Mexico were much cooler. And Giza 13,000 years ago would have looked like, you know, Louisiana today. Yeah, yeah, it would have been a swampy but quite temperate grassland with lakes and rivers. So when they built the pyramid, it wasn't in an empty desert. It was right. in an actually quite nice place. Right. So again, right. Ice Age, it's like, yeah, it was, if you lived in, you know, Chicago, it was the Ice Age. Right. But right. even that is not accurate. It's just a different right. pre-Holocene uh, age where sea levels were much lower. Mm -hmm. um, very likely Cuba was connected to Mexico on a land bridge. Um, and again, the, when you look at, for example, the, the pyramid complex that an explorer, the, the same explorer that found the wreck of the USS Maine from the Spanish-American War, she found an entire city underwater at about 3,800 feet underwater off the western coast of Cuba, Paula Zaletsky. I, I was just putting it up. <laughs> so yeah. you speaking. I know. I'll put so, it up right now. And, and what she determined was that it appears that this whole chunk fell straight into the ocean. Yeah. There it is. Uh, the sunken city of Cuba. I mean... Look at this thing right in here. I'll try to get this. Uh, yeah, that's a good picture. Right there. Okay. Hold because right. that was connected by a land bridge. Okay. So what happened to the sunken city of Cuba? So, yeah, right there. This is where it's it's believed to be. So you look at this. It looks awful familiar, doesn't it, with the whole layout? Right. It's, an, guys it's right an, here. an almost exact analog of Mayan and Aztec temples. And it makes sense because back then, 12,000 years ago, those would have been connected. And again, even the Aztecs said, we didn't build the Pyramid of the Sun. You know, we 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 didn't we, we inherited this city right. and some of these temples. Just like in, uh, what is it, Machu Picchu, <laughs> the Inca will say, yes. we did not build this. And you can right. see because the part that they built is like, conventional it's just very small right. bricks on top of megalithic yes. bricks yes. so you know it's so who it's, built those you're right right so i don't know do you, i mean you know we know that they branched out they would have had to and then we determined this they were an advanced people they're not going to limit themselves to one little island out right. in the middle of the ocean or someplace they're, they're, in a large they're... island uh, i mean a pretty big island actually i would say the island was and, and Frederick Oliver, th mm -hmm. th this was really the kicker to me, Michelle, was when in 1882, when no map on planet Earth or the technology existed yeah. to map accurately the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, he right. draws a sketch of the island of Poside, which right. when I looked at a modern satellite scan of the bottom of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge where the Azores are now, oh, yeah, it is yeah. identical. Yes. And it's like, again, that's not a guess. That's no. what Plato said it was. I believe that's it's where, in the Azores. I do. I believe it's in the Azores. Yeah, that's where Poside is. Poside, right. the, 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 the islands of the Azores now were the mountaintops of Poside. That's yes. what I say. Right. Of the empire, <laughs> right. which stretched all through the Mediterranean, according right. to Plato, parts of North Africa, and right. had knowledge of North America, and according to the channel sources, had colonized up to Arizona. Right. 
right. had outposts all over the world. Just like I would tell people, if you're looking for the British Empire in 5,000 years, if everything's destroyed, and you right. find evidence of English language and culture in India, it doesn't mean you found England. It means you found the British Empire's outposts. Right. England's a small island that dominated the world for hundreds right. of years. So right. why couldn't a larger island with better technology Dominate in a more favorable <laughs> climate? Because it's not like yes. England's exactly the best climate. No, England no, has a lot it's, of it's, problems. Yeah. Oh, yes. Pla Plato describes basically, imagine if the Azores were a subcontinent. All the abundance, the food, the, the beauty of this would actually be like the ideal island empire from which to dominate the Atlantic Ocean. So it's actually, it makes what? perfect sense. Well, and, and it makes you wonder, did they venture out? You know, there's there's these these cultures that are in Antarctica that we're not allowed to really get in there and, and be made privy to a whole lot of information. But, you know, there are people, and, and I mean, they even scientists, like, no, we found natural lake over there. We know it's a continent. We found old structures from an ancient mm. civilization. They tell you that much. They don't right. tell you how much of an advanced civilization people are, are making the assumption that you know you're dealing with ancient Lemurians or maybe the Atlanteans made their way there upon destruction or just plainly made their way there and continued on mm -hmm. over to South America to build most of the monuments that you see there as well. Well, we know that <clears throat> two things with that. We know, for example, that um, you know, as Graham Hancock showed many times i think in fingerprints of the gods he first brought it to the public's attention with the piri rays map from you know i think 1513 mm -hmm. which you know was found in a library or a temple i know it was in a administrative building in istanbul and right. you know piri reis was a turkish admiral of the ottoman empire who said look i base this map on much older source maps columbus said the same thing those maps have been lost or they're in the Vatican basement like everything else. But right. um, in that map or the fragment that we have of that map, it shows Antarctica free of ice with rivers that we know through satellite imaging are under the ice. And so when Charles Hapgood sent a letter to the Navy observation office like that does aerial surveys, he said in the 60s, he said, can you explain how a 15th, 16th century map accurately mapped Antarctica? Wasn't Antarctica discovered in the 19th century by, you know, Shackleton or these English explorers? They said, this is impossible. And they actually said in the letter, this makes no sense because the the what we thought people knew at that time was, mm -hmm. you know, if this is not concurrent with. The, the detail and they said actually the detail of this map is almost exactly the detail of modern aerial surveys meaning they ha whoever made this or the original map must have been using aerial sur you know surveillance but that's impossible because the wright brothers invented airplanes you know so <laughs> right and and when was the last time antarctica was free of ice at least 12,000, probably 20,000 years ago. Yes. Which, again, if you look at Edgar Casey's and Frederick Oliver's stories of what yes. was going on in the world, you know, Edgar Casey basically says the proto-Atlantis goes back over 100,000 years. It's the right. default civilization of Earth. Right. Right. And then it is destroyed 90,000 years later. And God knows how many iterations of government and religion and culture. But yes. that really, we are living in the exception, which is the weird window where Atlantis is destroyed, let's say 9,600 BC. The world is traumatized from this cataclysm. Mm -hmm. Civilizations reboot slowly. And then you have what we call the, you know, rebirth of civilization in Sumeria and places like this around, you know, roughly 3000 BC. But it's like, that's the exception. The, the norm was actually that we lived in a near Star Wars level of technology universe 
mm. in what we would call the ancient past. Right. Right. So oh. yeah, that's boy, that's a show just in itself. What um you also made mention of Mount Shasta in Kwong Sanctuary. Mount <laughs> Shasta is a crazy Kwong. place. We have to do yeah. I'm Even right now, it's it's crazy portals, stargates, and mm. right. So, people believe the ancient Lemurians were there. Do you think that maybe they were the Atlanteans as well, or just the Atlanteans? Because I think they would have made it that far if they made it to South America. Why not go up? Yeah, I mean, look, I I don't I don't claim anything. Um, are there is there <laughs> a Lemurian fellowship living in Mount Shasta in a Crystal Palace? I don't know. It's possible. Uh, I mean, according crazy. to you know yeah. remote according to two of the greatest remote viewers in you know the cia um you know there are four uh, underground mountain bases where extraterrestrials are monitoring humanity uh and that, that you can read the declassified document oh. um that's nothing that's surprises not, me <laughs> that's not right. my opinion that was the opinion of right. people yeah. who had seen military I operations through remote yeah. viewing right. um so and we have military bases in NORAD that you can't see from the surface. So, of course, are there people living in Mount Shasta? I don't know. Um, but, you know, according to Casey, Oliver, all of these mm -hmm. people, it's like it wasn't just just like today. Like maybe there's a predominant culture called Western culture that every yes. culture on Earth is aware of or influenced by or trying to emulate. Right. But there's then russian culture which is very different than the west especially yes. today right there's chinese communism there's all kinds of other superpowers that are competing mm -hmm. right and in the story of atlantis in frederick oliver's account it's the same thing there's this group called you know suern in india mm -hmm. that are equally advanced but in a metaphysical way mm -hmm. they don't need technology they can right. defeat the armies of Atlantis through psychic abilities, he says. Right. There's other cultures that are primitive that right. still hunt with bows and arrows while yes. he's flying over their cities or yes. rather their, their settlements in a in a it's just, it's the same as today. Like I can take a private jet and fly over cannibals in Papua New Guinea. That, <laughs> if you take a snapshot you can do it of, in Haiti now, too, apparently. <laughs> Oh, you can go hang out with barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I know. I worry about my relatives <laughs> in the nearby islands that eat my family. Mm. Actually, you know, I, I heard something recently. It doesn't surprise me that 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 uh he really wasn't the head of this cannibal force, that he actually was kind of framed because he's an opposition leader. So I want to give all credit oh, to barbecue. If you, if you aren't keep eating that, people, keep that gentle. <laughs> if you aren't eating people and you're a good guy, yeah. that's great. But but if yeah. you are if you are eating people, you know, make sure you put <laughs> it's enough. Not a good idea. Yeah. Barbecue sauce, because that's how I like to eat. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you know. Yeah. It, it, that's it's, whole, that's, it's like, that's great for our political shows on Friday night. <laughs> right. But, you know, it's an important it's an important point because, right. you know, if you if you take a snapshot of, of a time like 2024. Right. And let's say we move the clock to the year 5000. If, if they found a, an artifact of bows and arrows from Papua New Guinea and right. they correctly dated them to 2024. Right. Well, yeah. That means that somewhere there was a person using a bow and arrow, but mm -hmm. then there was like SpaceX launch, right. but they didn't find the rocket or the material the rocket's made of doesn't last that long. Right. So it's the same thing. It's like you can't just look at a snapshot of 12,000 BC and say, well, these were Neolithic people. Yeah, sure. There were Neolithic people. Mm -hmm. And Neolithic people use stone tools and stone lasts a long time. But that yeah. aluminum ship that Frederick Oliver's source was flying through, aluminum, even if it's Atlantean aluminum from Atlantean Home Depot, it ain't going to last 12,000 years. Right. right. It's still a physical object constrained by the laws of reality. So mm -hmm. we need to be clear on that, that right. finding ancient things does not preclude the existence of the simultaneous technological mm -hmm. advances from that mm -hmm. time right. like 
We're not going to find an iPhone in 12,000 years. But you no. might hear a story of how people spoke into a mirror. Well, I mean, I think there's so many out of place artifacts out there that that are leaving people scratching their heads. That we, mm. we know what happens, whether the time shifts, time travel, whether people using portal stargates. I mean, technology is out there. The ancient people, you know, everybody settled around power spots. It's not uncommon. They built their, their temples and monuments over power spots. Atlanteans probably created a lot of these power spots, but also, or mm -hmm. would have used them to their advantage through their technology. I, I believe there's, we're primitive in some ways. I think the ancients were ahead of us in a lot of ways because it's just, you know, we live in a time of, of corruption. I truly believe in, in, in suppression. Well, and you We know, live in the end of the Kali Yuga, literally the most corrupt time possible yeah. in the 25,000 year Yuga cycle. Is right. Our it's on time. a need to know basis. And apparently we all don't need to know. <laughs> right. right. And so, if you think that the government, you know, who's reverse engineered extraterrestrial craft at skunk works and all these places, if you don't think, I mean, whistleblowers by their own admission have said we everything you see in Star Trek we can do, but of course. Well, Gene not. Roddenberry was said to have met with the Council of Nine. Star Trek well, was supposed to be like a, a a project to see how would humanity react to seeing humans and, and beings I, from other worlds working together, being side and by I mean, side. And you know, I wouldn't doubt that because I, I mentioned that briefly yeah. in, in the book because Phyllis go. Schlemmer, who was a famous channeler of yes. this council who wrote this great book, The Only Planet of Choice. Really interesting book. But in that book, she talks about Atlantis as this ah. kind of ancient project. And it was indeed claimed that Roddenberry got the inspiration to create Star Trek from his good friend, Phyllis Schlemmer, who is a channeler talking to aliens or an alien consciousness. Right, there we go. That's a kind of well, soft introduction to the idea of the Federation, the Prime sure. Directive. The Prime board. Directive, yeah. <laughs> You know, I would argue the Borg are alive and well right now. Um, they just <laughs> medical, you know, white. Oh, we, we could folks. get into some, like, <laughs> might have to censor the show, but boy, we could get into some good stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, let me ask you this. Do you think that the Atlanteans were, do you think maybe that they were extraterrestrial, an advanced civilization that settled here? You know, it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's almost like semantics because, you know, we like to think of extraterrestrials purely as, you know, physical, organic beings, you know, mm -hmm. um, many of which probably are real and have been recovered and, you know, mm -hmm. and they're little biological androids that we call the greys that many people have. Well, played. I think Anunnaki and ancient Sumerian kings ruled for 20,000 years at right. a time. Or, right. And, you know. you know, that's the thing. It's like, if you look at the Sumerian records and then you look at, you know, the, the correct translation of the book of Genesis, which, you know, I would argue is a copy of the Babylonian accounts that they got from their captivity there. I mean, but if you look at all of these, it's, it's, it, it's using language that suggests the progenitors of humanity were from the sky. Like right. even the God quote unquote, one of many in the old Testament is an Elohim who comes from a sky council, exactly. the Seba Hashmaim, the sky armies, the council <laughs> in the sky. Yes. Um, yes. And are portrayed as, you know, beings that use technology that the primitive humans, you know, attribute Absolutely. to a Absolutely. Look at the Dogon people who talk the about Dogon. the Sirius from, from Sirius, you know, like. And they, and they knew about a star behind Sirius that nobody even knew about at the time. Here Until the telescopes got more advanced. It's like, how the hell does this tribe in Africa know about astronomy exactly. better than NASA? You have a right. group of primitive people, you know, throughout the ancient world and, and throughout the new world when you're looking at the indigenous people who led primitive existences and came into contact with somebody who were far more advanced. Right. You know, and, and, and when you look at the Aztecs saying, no, you know, we, this was left for us. We, we've just taken this over and you look at these incredible structures that mirror the incredible construction of the great pyramids and such. These are worldwide pyramids mm -hmm. are being found all over the world. And people are like, no, that's a mountain. No, the hell it's not. It's a dang pyramid. All you right. have to do is just open your eyes. It's been yeah. grown over. And but you know, it's there. you know, I always tell people with that particular case, like look at a picture 
of Teotihuacan in Mexico from like 1900. Right. And it it really looks like a mountain. Yes. It really does. The whole thing is covered with dirt and plant. It's very hard to see anything. Sure. But then you look at it after and it's like, oh, my God, it looks like this magnificent, ornate temple. But I mean, that was sitting there for a long time. And people, well, I think, over. knew it was yeah. a temple, but they're just like, oh, the mountain, you know, the big mountain. Right. But so that's right. a problem. Technology, is we, we have a bit of an edge with technology. And, you know, there's an archaeologist out who does a lot of stuff out in Egypt now. And she does mm. all of her research and has found phenomenal structures. And she, I don't think she's found another an extra, like, two or 400 pyramids through mm. satellites. Wow. All wow. through satellites. And she's pegged them all off. She found, you know, ancient cities. And she's found them out in the desert, and they at least sure. know where they are now. I think we have a bit of an edge with technology to find some of these places. And let's look at, like, I don't know, can we talk about the Grand Canyon and the big Buddha that's in there? <laughs> An Egyptian hieroglyph Allegedly. that happens to just be off limits and owned by who? NASA. Yeah. That whole area. Well, NASA. you know, the, I. I would encourage people to read that chapter of the book because I do include it um, in the section on like debunking because that's a famous case where the whole debunking community jumped on it. Um, right. You know, and that story originally the story of, you know, Kincaid, who was this guy, yeah. you know, in a canoe going down, I think it was like the Green River. And he saw kind of weird opening in the side of the Grand mm -hmm. Canyon, went inside and claims to have discovered this huge Indian Buddha, like a Buddhist temple mm -hmm. with, with a Buddha yeah. holding two cacti yeah. of good and evil and, and all these vases. And then, of course, the Smithsonian comes in and, and the story is gone. Well, that's why they're, they're, they've been trying to debunk it. But the story of the debunking has been debunked by other people. Right. And what's and, interesting. And, and NASA just ruined it by saying, no, you can't come here. We own it. Yeah, how convenient. They, they own it. Well, what's really crazy is that right before I published the book, I was like, I wonder, because I had this very good um, uh, search engine where I could search for key terms from the entire Edgar Casey psychic catalog of 15,000 yes. readings, wh right. which was like an invaluable tool. Right. So I really was like, did he ever talk about this? Mm. And in a, like a total freak, like I, I don't even think I could re reproduce this level of like luck. I just typed in like, you know, Arizona, Arizona, right. Grand Canyon. And, and it was like thousands of results because it was like a person's address or this or unrelated but then I found one reading that I've never seen anybody, even in like Edgar Casey specialists site, where somebody asked him about that culture. And he says, well, believe it or not, a long time ago, like many, many, many millennia ago, a mm. group of people left India and settled in the mountains of what you would call Arizona and they no. became the and he says and they were called the Hapa Pulpic people and a friend of mine because she lives there she's like you know there's a Native American tribe called like the Hava something chick like it sounds right. just like what Casey's stenographer wrote down or like a permutation of that right. and what's weird is he says and then they proceeded to build their temples in the caves of the mountains and I'm like that's on Believable. That's exactly what Kincaid said, but you didn't read Kincaid. No, nobody read that story because it was published in right. the Arizona Gazette, a local tabloid. Well, not the I, New York I mean, you look at uh, Deborah Thunderbeat. <clears throat> she, she lives out there. She's been on the show a couple of times. Brilliant. She does a tour out there that, that she or she shows you with her ancient Egyptian monuments. You can look right at it. It looks like a great sphinx. It looks like it, it sure. looks like pyramids. You're thinking, <laughs> I'm or, sorry. The, or the, 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 I would argue, but you know, and again, we have to be careful. Are they ancient Egyptian or are they Atlantean, which yes. then became Egyptian culture? Yes, yes. See, that's, that's the thing. That's what people have to yes. remember is that according to Edgar Casey, he had like a hundred readings on this time period 
Right. Because a lot of his clients, he claimed, had past lives in Giza at 10,500 BC when they were rebooting Atlantean culture. And he's very direct and detailed. And he says, what you would call Egyptian culture right. is a mixture. It's a mixture of incoming Atlanteans, right. native Africans, and then incoming people from the Carpathian Mountains who all were at one point warring with each other. Yes. And then eventually a leader emerged and then he joined with the Atlantean king that had left, and nice. they together in unison created a new race and a new culture that later became dynastic Egypt. Right. So you can't say the Atlanteans built the pyramids alone. Like the right. architect was right. from the Carpathians. The right. builder was Atlantean. The right. laborers were a mixture of all three. It was like a collaborative project. Right. which is even cooler. And it right. explains why if you look at some of these pharaohs, it's like some look more African, some look Middle Eastern, some look white, yes. some look this, some look that. It's a crossroads region yes. even back then. Yes. yes. But the technology, Casey is very specific, but the high technology that built these structures came from Atlantis, that the people right. living there originally did not have that. It was brought to them from the island. And this is a good point. And there were giants <laughs> in those days. Yeah. There were. There were. Right. And like you explained before, you know, I mean, if the pyramids are built with frequency, then without a doubt, this technology would have been brought into the new world as well. I mean, they're yeah, still doing right. it. You look at the Coral Castle right. in Florida. Yeah, where that I'm from. was allegedly he did this with frequency. Yeah. And that's pretty modern times. It is. Yeah, right? no, it is. And yeah, that was, you know, 100 years ago, he did that or something. Yeah. Um, and the kid Correct. saw him holding what he said was an ice cream cone <laughs> shaped thing that levitated the blocks at night. A kid snuck over the fence in Miami and was and like, hey, him. and watched him. He was using sound to levitate yes. rocks. And, you know, Frederick Oliver has a whole chapter that I encourage people to read in the book on the science that he would have been using, which is called the night side forces, which wow. I would argue Tesla understood, which is he claimed, you know, everything, every motivating force, as he describes it, has a like cathodic opposite called the night side. And where they meet, there's mm -hmm. a very powerful force that right. can be used for like alchemical purposes. But right. he says in the times of Atlantis, he's like, they understood, for example, he says that gravity was an octave of vibration. And if you could decouple that octave from its octave, you could make things right. weightless and then move them. Right. Using I, so I it was sound. It was basically like, yeah, gravity is real, but it's not yes. just, it's not the way Newton thinks it works. It's actually, you can decouple things from their relative gravity field and move them using mm -hmm. sound frequencies. People can levitate. I probably, I would like to. Oh, you do look at some of the llamas; like they, they most certainly know how to levitate. Like they come wow. right off the floor and they can bounce. Yeah, we we had a show on it. Somebody, uh, Preston Dennett, showed some like amazing stuff. There's all kinds of stories about people who can levitate. So I, I, wow. I mean, are we talking mindset now, <laughs> not just devices, but but the power of of our abilities? We are a race or a species with amnesia. I say it all the time. I love that Graham Hancock said it. Sure. You know, we we are supposed to come from these incredible abilities, especially those, you know, of us who may descend, you know, hmm. from Atlantis. And what I find, you know, really well, We all do. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. And they say, you know, the Iroquois people, um, you know, from North America are said to be direct descendants. That's and, what and, Casey said. And, yeah, and uh, and I have that in my bloodline. So I thought, oh, I used to get people would give me readings and say, oh, you're from Atlantis. I'm like, yeah, yeah, aren't we all? But then mm. you know, as you start digging a little bit, I thought I found that to be really interesting. Um, mm. But anyway, you look at it, they've left behind a heck of a legacy. And sure. they've left behind, I think, a history that will continue to keep people enthralled 
wanting to yes. know more, waiting. Like people, I think, expect it to magically just come up out of the water. And if it's off the coast of the Azores, they're working on it. <laughs> you know, they yeah. are, the archaeologists are, you know, avidly researching this to see if they can find that information. But at the same time, because it's in the, you know, whenever something's in the ocean, if you're not babysitting it, you know, who knows, right? right? Well, and, you know, it's interesting because um, I briefly mentioned in the book, you know, in 2012, there was a Portuguese fisherman, Dio Clesiano Silva, and yes. he found an enormous pyramid bigger than yes. Giza in yes. about 400 feet of water off yes. the island of Tercera. And I contacted him. He's very old. He's he's in poor health. But he gave me the coordinates. And he says, I swear to God, that's real. I'm not making any of this up. Like right. I'm an experienced right. fisherman. I found yeah. a damn pyramid at the bottom of the ocean. And right. I told the Portuguese military. And they found it again. And they said, well, that's a mountain. It's not a mountain. But you look at the picture of, it, book of the depth finder. It's an exactly cardinally aligned, geometrically perfect yes. Pyramid, and then you yes. can see the. And I know this because I was a deep sea fisherman my entire life. I'm from South Florida. Right. I've never seen that die. A, if I, I've, I've looked at a depth finder my entire childhood. My father was a fishing boat captain. Right. There, there is never a time where I'm over a reef or a sea mount fishing for groupers where I see a right perfect diamond amid the regular rock contours. Yes. So it is yes. down there. And again. Right that would be concurrent or that would be a rather like that would fit the narrative and what else that, is down there yeah, right right and you, you know, know it's exciting maybe and, and you know the thing is like i don't get upset because i i've long passed the point of like wanting you know fame yes. I, I i don't even particularly even like uh too many interviews because it's kind of i don't really like listening to myself talk to be honest with you. I never listen. <laughs> but right. You know, I, I I kind of caution certain people that that are looking for like a quick fix, like the reshot structure, which again could be man-made, could be natural. I think mm -hmm. Randall Carlson is pretty conclusively proven that you can observe that formation on other planets. Yes. Doesn't mean that the city of Atlantis was on Mars before. Right could be natural but the location is not where it's supposed to be so it's if it is man-made it's not the capital city from the platonic dialogues now because they had you know global colonies it's possible that it could be a sister city but it's kind of it does annoy me when people say we have found atlantis and it bothers me on multiple levels because number one Atlantis isn't a city. Hmm. If you find right. London, did you find the British Empire? No. Right. right. If you found the island of England, you didn't find the British Empire. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, what are we looking for? If you're looking for the capital city from Plato's Critias, okay, now we're narrowing it down. Is that at the reshot structure in Mauritania? No, probably not, because that's not where Plato said it was. Right. Is it something else? I don't know. Maybe. Right. But right. even if that were a capital city, it's way bigger than what he describes because he literally delimits right. the length and width of the canals, which don't fit this enormous, you know, right. structure. Right. But mm. even then, let's just say that really was exactly what he said. OK, well, that's not the end of the story. Right. You know, like Plato was describing a city on a large, huge island, bigger than mm -hmm. England, off the coast of the, you know, say Portugal. Right. He says in front of the Straits of Hercules, Pillars of Hercules, outside of that. And, you know, that had colonies all through the Mediterranean mm -hmm. and was aware right. of North America. So it's like people today are like, I don't know where this came from either, but people today are obsessed. I think it's just a product of the TikTok world. Like, I want an answer. I don't really want to ask this 
long, complicated story. Just show me where it is. Show me, Jimmy. Right, show me right. the circular city, Jimmy. Right, right. And it looks good, and it makes for great Joe Rogan podcasts, but it's not even 1% of the totality of what we're talking about. We're talking about a multi-millennial right. culture that went through God knows how many permutations, and, you know, of which... Plato's giving a tiny infinitesimal snapshot third hand from its right. final days after it had lost all of its technology and was reduced to this bronze age sail culture that was right. hell bent on this like one final war with the Mediterranean. Right. Now, Edgar Casey doesn't even talk about that time period. All of his right. Atlantis stories basically lead up to that where it's a totally different world, where people are using flying devices, where people have cell phones, they have video right. calls, conference calls, and, you know, it's like... Yeah, it, it's, it's, so, it, it, gets, it gets crazy, you know? Right. It gets crazy. There's just so much information. I wish we had more time. <laughs> yeah, it always happens. We start getting right into it, then it's just like... Well, part three. I know. So tell everybody where to buy your book. Tell everybody what you've got coming up, how to find you. And so on. Okay. Well, I'm usually at a bar <laughs> in Monterey, Mexico, every Saturday night. Called nice. Cafe Iguana. You can come have a tequila with me. Right. I don't want to talk about Atlantis, though. No. Um, <laughs> tequila works. <laughs> the book, yeah. The book is um, Visions of Atlantis: Reclaiming Our Lost Ancient Legacy. You can find it on Amazon and also Barnes and Noble. And if you'd like to send me a question or a comment, you can go to Michael Leflem with my last name as one word, dot com. And um, you can see some really interesting um, other resources, some sources. Um, I have a link to a bunch of ebook versions of very old public record books on Atlantis that you should read that are very interesting, kind of out of print stuff. And. Um, yeah, if you'd like to, um, you know, read the book, you can get it on Kindle, hardcover, softcover, and also a very nice audiobook uh, edition. But uh, I would, re I would really recommend the the print if you can, because there's so many pictures. There's like 85 pictures in the right. book, maps and things like that, that that I think really help. Um, Pull, pull away with a lot of the confusion, you know, like coming from you, when, someone when, who's who's read the book. Yes, it does. It's yeah, really, like when really when, you, well when you see when you see things, sometimes people th that that's like some people learn through listening, but you know when you see a map and then a sketch, it's kind of like you don't need me to tell you this is real. It's right. just a visceral feeling of like, oh my god, how could this be coincidence? Or you know, right. or when you see the face of the people that are doing these studies, it's like, do you trust Edgar Casey? Well, look at five pictures of him. Do you right. seem like a charlatan to you? You know, right. I mean, I really, really spent a lot of time like trying to humanize what mm -hmm. I think had become a very kind of like abstract story. Because it's a, at the end of the day, it's kind of like the story. It's the most human story, and it's the biggest one that we seem to ignore and think right. it's silly when in fact it's probably the most important story in history and i'm saying that as a I agree. professor of history i agree and it's, it's definitely one that leaves people wanting more well thank you so much for joining me <laughs> it just yeah. it, it's just always fantastic conversation and my door here is always open. And I know Amelia's kind of like under the weather. It just seems to have been the norm <laughs> last time you were on. But no, and thank you for I it's a good thing. I was just running to the 7-Eleven to get my coffee. I was I had my suit ready to go. And when you told me, no, no, we're alive. So I, I apologize I for being in my tank top, but I, I promise I, I have a, my suit ready to go. I just didn't want to make you late. That's okay. That's okay. It, you know, it was good to have you on. It's all about the information and it's all about the discussion and it was fantastic. And I will be in touch, of course, and uh, always happy to do it again. <laughs> Let's keep going. 
<laughs> no, thank you. And I, I think it's just, that's all you can do is what I tried to do. Ask questions. I, I don't like telling people what to think. I don't like arguing, debating. I mean, it's look, here's the evidence I've found. This is what right. I think could have happened. Beyond right. that, I can say nothing. Right. That's it. That's you know? all you can do. That's, That's all you, all can, you do. can do. It's Just a phenomenal book, questions. guys. Get out, read it. I've got uh, a link to Amazon in the show description. You guys should just go click on it. It's there. Nice and easy for you all. The website is there also. So just nice and easy. Well, thank you very much. And I will be in touch. Oh, thank you, Michelle. I had a nice time. <laughs> always. Goodbye. It's always a great time. Okay. Take Thanks, care. Thanks, Michael. Bye-bye. Good night. Well, that was definitely a fantastic show. He is just a wealth of information. And Alan, nice to see you here. So hard. I can't, you know, when we're into a deep discussion, it's hard for me to, to interact as much as I'd like to with chat. But thank you guys for being here. And Alan, hopefully you'll be here a little bit more. We've got great, great people coming up. So, Next week, guys, I mean, well, first off, big thank you to Michael LaFlemme and, and part two of this discussion. Um, Alan, you were asking about part one. I had it featured actually all week, but you can find it in the archives. It, it's, you know, in the last, I think it was on two, three months ago. Um, I could probably find that out relatively easy for you. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Michael, go back to January 17th, which is when he was on. So you will find part one. So big thank you to Folgers Coffee for sponsoring this evening's show and every evening show. We appreciate you so very much. Folgers, we love you. Big thank you to Justin Snicker, a.k.a. Dr. Snick, the sonic surgeon. Big thank you to Steve McGinnis. We appreciate you all so very much. Make sure you go to Roku and check out. Um, I'm going to put this up again as well because this is new for me, guys. I'm just adding this guy on. So here we go. Um, go check it out. Uh, you'll find some of the archives there as well. So nice and convenient for you guys. Um, next week on Wednesday, for the very first time, we're bringing on Dan Shaw. Now, he this guy works in Vortexes and he, he works with portals and vortices and it's just phenomenal phenomenal work he's authored a number of books on vortexes including vortex field guide north america he's been on many different television shows brad Meltzer's decoded the devil's triangle alaska on history channel mysteries of the national parks yosemite travel channel the documentary called ancient tomorrow and he consults for shows including uh probably totally miss that uh the blacklist sorry <laughs> and thursday for the very first time we bring on mindy toutfest and she's going to be talking about her book dying to meet them one woman's incredible journey from nde to uap now we've talked about a lot of different uh, a lot of shows where we've talked about people who've had near-death experiences who have had um you know, visits with extraterrestrials and so on. So it's just, it's going to be excellent and two new faces, which is really, really awesome. So with that being said, I bid you all good night. Have a wonderful weekend. Check out the eclipse. That'll be really cool. I know Niagara Falls apparently is under a state of emergency and it's just supposed to be craziness with like millions of people, a million people coming from the U S and million people are more coming from the Canada side and everybody's converging in Niagara and it's going to be, it's going to be wild for all those who live there. So anyway, wish them well, if you see it, enjoy it. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Thank you. And good night.